connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. everyone and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Paula Robeson, your host for the next hour. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community and our goal is to spark conversation, ideas and action. Since we're live, I want to remind everyone about how to ask questions of the presenters. The audience lines are muted, so we don't take questions over those lines. However, you all have the opportunity to type your questions into the question box at any time. We'll check for questions at the end of the session. Don't feel you need to wait until then before posing a question. Just type them in the question box as you think of them. We're delighted to welcome today another Ch Children's Healthcare Canada member, Alberta Children's Hospital, to bring you this webinar about their pediatric outreach program. For those of you on Twitter, please tag us at ChildHealthCan for any webinar-related tweet and share away. We would like to, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Tina Saxon. Born and raised in Calgary, Tina graduated from the University of Calgary with a Bachelor of Nursing degree. Her career spanned many years, first as a clinical nurse on units and the emergency department, then as a sessional instructor for the university, and more recently as a project manager for quality improvement consultant and outreach services coordinator. When she's not at work, Tina enjoys being outdoors, hiking, golfing, gardening, and spending time with her family. And it's my pleasure to pass the mic to Tina. Thank you, Paula, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be providing an overview of our outreach services. I've listed the various components I'll be covering. We'll talk about the background and history, the benefits and expected outcomes, our current clinics, key outreach and clinic processes, funding, and our centralized model. I'll also discuss our what makes it successful and some of the challenges we faced. I'll also be highlighting potential opportunities and answering any questions you may have about outreach at the end. First, for the background, for many years, ACH has partnered with the Department of Pediatrics and healthcare sites across Southern Alberta to provide families with subspecialty healthcare within their local community. Historically, outreach services were often started as a result of a discussion between an ACH physician and a physician from another region. By 2002, we had nine clinics across Lethbridge, Red Deer, and Medicine Hat. Some of these clinics had been operating for some time, others were struggling with resource issues or fiscal constraints, and for others, development of new clinics were being considered. To help provide some structure to our outreach services, an outreach framework was developed and implemented in 2002. This became the foundation for, for providing, developing, and evaluating outreach services. As well, service level agreements were created for each clinic outlining how services will be provided. The number of clinics that would occur, it included resource requirements, i.e. what's needed to run the clinic, roles and responsibilities, who will do what, and key processes for referrals, scheduling, and registering patients, as well as uh, sorry, evaluation plans, which included family and provider surveys. Why do we do outreach services? ACH has a mandate to provide specialty healthcare services to children and youth throughout Southern Alberta. 
This supported Calgary Health Region's mission to provide community-based accessible services. Thus, ACH was committed towards providing services as close to home as possible through outreach methods. Although the Alberta Health Services and ACH landscape has gone through some changes over the years, today outreach still aligns with Alberta Health Services strategic planning goals, supports three areas of focus, improving access, improving population health, and responsiveness to consumers and communities, as well it aligns with AHS's core values and their health plan and business plan. It also aligns with ACH's strategic and operational directions, where resources are based on specific demand and need and provided on outreach basis. Patient and family-centered care is embraced by all service providers in the delivery of care, and there's access to care. The expected outcomes and benefits of outreach are several. It facilitates access to highly specialized pediatric healthcare resources that aren't available locally. It helps improve communication and fosters relationships between healthcare providers across healthcare sites or zones, thus enhancing continuity of care. It supports patient family-centered care practices by enabling, enabling more or all family members to be active participants in the healthcare team. It improves professional knowledge and our capacity. There's opportunity for subspecialty residents or fellows to attend the outreach clinics. This helps them gain perspective on patients and families in the context of their home community. As well, local healthcare providers benefit. There's often case reviews, informal presentations, or lunch discussions that occur. The number of clinics we've had over the years has fluctuated, and we've had up to 40 outreach clinics at one time. This map provides a good overview of the current scope of our outreach services. At present, there are 22 outreach clinics across Southern Alberta. Our medical clinics in Medicine Hat, Chinook, and Red Deer involve up to seven subspecialty areas. There are also pediatric clinics in Morley and Eden Valley. There are five intersectoral clinics in Calgary where we partner with other healthcare sites, community pediatrician, pediatricians, and other child serving agencies that help youth at risk. For today's presentation, I'll be mainly focusing on the Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, and Red Deer outreach clinics. First, I wanna show you some of our data. In 2018 and 19, we did 98 clinics across Red Deer, Lethbridge, and Medicine Hat, and we saw 829 patients. 70 of those patients were in Red Deer, 291 were in Medicine Hat, and in Lethbridge, we saw 468 patients. The chart on the right shows the number of patients seen by subspecialty area. Genetics saw the most patients because they conducted the most clinics. As well, for the type of patients that are seen, we saw 309 new patients and 520 follow-up patients. As mentioned earlier, telehealth was also part of the outreach services in the early days. A number of our outreach clinics also see patients via telehealth on a regular basis. This can be done a couple of different ways. A telehealth clinic can be set up separately or telehealth visits are often incorporated into existing ACH clinics. There are two diabetic telehealth clinics that happen per year and neurology runs a telehealth clinic once a month. It's determined at triage who would be appropriate for to be seen by telehealth or for some clinics such as GI, they have, they have identified a specific population, example, celiac patients. The ACH nurse is able to provide any additional information or teaching required by phone. To obtain the weight and height, families are asked to go to their GP's office prior to the telehealth visit. And support may also be available at the distant sites. For instance, the diabetic nurse or dietitian or the genetic counselor. The benefits for telehealth include efficiency as the clinic runs on time. It uses less resources as the nurse or allied healthcare providers don't typically attend. There's no need for physicians to travel. There's less travel for patients and families as they're only required to go to the telehealth location. It's relatively easy to set up. They now have a 
provincial scheduling system, and also we have in-house telehealth support. Numerous telehealth sites are also available across the province. Next, I want to talk about how we do our outreach services. Our clinic practice, our current practices are informed by a number of things. As mentioned earlier, the outreach framework provided the foundation that outreach services was built on. We also have our current ACH and AHS practices. Provincially, we have path to care guidelines that were implemented in 2014. These outline our referral and wait time management protocol and communication to family and referring sources. At ACH, we have what's called our OPIPs or our outpatient principles and practice. These comprise of seven key principles that guide our practices in all outpatient clinics and services. As well, we have recommendations from the outreach review that was conducted in 2014, where we had input from all key stakeholders. As part of this review, we also obtained family feedback and provider feedback. As well, a literature review and environmental scan was done, which I'll speak to later in the presentation. I wanted to share some of the family feedback with you. In the early days of outreach, family surveys were conducted annually. And as family feedback consistently indicated that these services were highly valued, the annual surveys were discontinued and we decided to only obtain feedback as needed. So when we did the review in 2014, we also surveyed families to obtain their perspective on the outreach services and the impact of having these services closer to home. There was good representation across the various clinics as well as locations that provide outreach services. So families completed a written survey while attending an outreach clinic. The response rate was quite high at 64% and this included families from Medicine Hat, Lethbridge and Red Deer. We were able to capture feedback from eight of our nine subspecialty areas. And the distribution of participants is indicated in the chart on the left. What the families told us was that they see these services as necessary. Another key area we asked about was how receiving care closer to home impacted their family. Outreach provided significant instrumental benefits. There was cost savings, less need for alternate childcare, and as well, it reduced the impact on factors related to social determinants of health where there were fewer days missed from work or school. It also had a positive impact on elements related to coping. There was less stress to the child and family and inclusion of others in the appointment. Next, I'll outline our key outreach processes. We schedule our clinics one year in advance. The number of clinics that occur has historically been determined by the service level agreements. Today, we use those agreements as a guide in discussions. We look at the need, the capacity of the physicians, and then we try to spread the clinics out over the year. We have a master calendar so everyone can see who's going when, as only one clinic can run at a time at a given site. Typically, it's only the subspecialists who travel, either flying or driving to the various outreach sites. However, there are exceptions. The CF nurse goes to the CF clinics and the genetic counselor may go to the genetic clinics. They drive to Red Deer and Lethbridge and as well, they may fly to Lethbridge during the winter months and they often fly to Medicine Hat throughout the year. It's often the same physicians going to the same locations. The subspecialties determine who, which physicians participate in the outreach clinics. There's a safety component to this as well and that there may have a physician with specialized skills that can't be off-site at a certain time. So of course they wouldn't be doing the outreach clinics. Some travel and do the clinics in the same day. Others do two-day clinics, for instance, neurology and genetics. We utilize a more consultative model where the subspecialist provides a consult to the referring physician or they may see their own ACH patients at an outreach site. The residents or fellows may attend outreach clinics. This enhances their clinical knowledge and understanding of healthcare services in smaller urban areas and enables more patients to be seen. 
patient information and documentation. Physicians have access to ACH patient information through the SCM system. As well, they can access test results or other consult letters from NetCare on site at the outreach. Consult letters are provided and there's dictation capabilities on site at the outreach clinics. Clinical support at the outreach site is provided by pediatric nurses, diabetic nurse or dietitian, genetic counselors, or the CF nurse. Service level agreements are created for new clinics, and we have outreach procedures for physician privileging, submitting travel expenses, and scheduling clinics. We have a shared drive to host all of the documents as well as the master schedule, so everyone can access them anytime and they're not having to um, contact me for information or wait for me to respond for things. For our clinic processes, referrals are received at ACH, then they're triaged for time, how, when they need to be seen and what location or how they should be seen. ACH clinics create a list of patients for the outreach clinics. There's also a few extra patients that are added to this list in case once they're calling, people are un unable to come on that date. Outreach sites book the patients and make reminder calls. Then ACH notifies patients and the referring sources about the appointments. Patients are seen in outreach. Consult letter is sent to the referring source with recommendations or any follow-up requirements. This was the referral process was a really uh, key element that was changed as a result of the 2014 review, as well as the implementation of our path to care guidelines. The benefits are patient safety. All referrals are in ACH's system. So that enables us to not only track them, but look, determine, um, see what the status of the referral is and relay that to people as needed. We have the right people doing the right job and it eliminates any potential for delays. It's patient-centered in that we try to see patients in their own community if appropriate and offer a choice of whether they want to come to ACH or the outreach site. Families still have connection to their local healthcare uh, site staff whom they may be familiar with as they will be the ones booking the appointments. It's efficient. We have the right person doing the right job at the right time. As well, the workload is shared. Often when it is a very time consuming to uh, book all of the patients, so it's a big help that the outreach sites are able to take this on. There's also closed loop communication. The referring sources are better informed about the status of the patient's referral, as well as when the appointments will be occurring. There's funding for physicians, travel costs, they, the flights or mileage if they drive are covered, meals, cabs, and parking as per AHS travel guidelines. The physicians pay for these costs up front and then get reimbursed. Travel costs are funded through various sources. The Zone Medical Affairs provide outreach sites with funds. The Canadian CF Foundation covers the cost for a CF clinics. And then as well, there's the Department of Pediatrics. Other resources such as my role or clinic or admin staff at ACH or the outreach sites are provided in kind, meaning their costs are absorbed in the site's operational costs. To help save costs for outreach, uh, we encourage clinics to do two-day clinics. There's savings related to flights and mileage and parking and cabs. AHS has also negotiated preferred rates with local hotels and clinics have developed criteria to determine which patients should be seen in outreach. This ensures the right patient is being seen at the right place and at the right time. As well, reminder calls are made by the outreach sites to avoid no-shows and last-minute cancellations. Next, I want to talk about our outreach model. To manage outreach, we've adopted a centralized model. 
We have a designated ACH manager who oversees outreach, and who brings a 30,000 foot perspective to planning, direction setting, and who would be aware of any ACH or Alberta Health Services initiative that could impact the outreach work. As well, she keeps senior leadership informed. We have a medical and medical lead and operational lead, uh, which is shown in the chart here. And then to manage the day-to-day -day functioning of outreach, there's my role as outreach coordinator. I'm responsible for creating the outreach schedule, addressing any issues that come up, creating and updating the outreach procedures, compiling outreach data, and maintaining relationships with the ACH and outreach stakeholders involved in outreach. To help with admin support, we have an outreach secretary, and the three of us in the center there form the core of the outreach team. We are further supported by the section chiefs, so sometimes if there's a, issue, a bigger issue that comes up related to the whole clinic itself, we will engage with the section chiefs to have that discussion with the outreach uh, physician, uh, the outreach uh, Chief of Staff for Pediatrics at the outreach site. As well, we're supported by the outreach physicians of the different subspecialty areas. The operational managers, both from ACH and outreach, provide support, and the admin and clerical staff are integral to the day-to-day -day work of outreach. The benefits to having a centralized model are several. It provides a central point of contact for inquiries or concerns for both ACH staff and the outreach staff. It facilitates a coordinated scheduling of clinics. It enables central person to oversee any major changes required that might be common across all of the clinics. Outreach information or processes can be updated and circulated more easily in that it's coming from one source. Collecting and compiling outreach data centrally is more efficient. And as there's less people involved to deal with issues, it's more efficient and the communication is better. If we didn't have a centralized model, the overseeing of outreach would be taken on by the various managers who uh, have these various clinics within their portfolio. I asked a couple of the managers to provide uh, some feedback of the benefits of having a centralized model from their perspective. So one manager was saying that the relationship and knowledge that we have of the outreach sites greatly helps with collaboration and communication. I can see outreach falling off the side of the manager's desk. As well, secondly, you're able to dedicate more time to issues and other day-to-day -day operations. This allows me to focus on other time, other items. So they have found it. So I think it's very um, beneficial for them to be able to rely on somebody else to take care of some of the issues that crop up. Next, I want to talk about what has contributed to our success. Definitely the commitment of ACH to provide these services and they're supported by senior leadership and Department of Pediatrics. Our centralized model with dedicated resources for outreach has helped things run very smoothly. We have engagement and dedication of our ACH physicians has been a big factor. We also can't underestimate the value of the relationships we've built with the outreach sites and the ACH staff who are involved in outreach. Standardized outreach processes help ensure consistency across all clinics. We have a shared drive to house all the outreach information. This is accessible to everyone who's involved with outreach. They can access it at any time and they know that it's the most current. So previously uh, there was a lot of this was written that uh, different clinics had binders and it was uh, very difficult to keep these binders all up to date. And as people uh, changed, their binders was not necessarily updated, etc. So this has been really helpful in keeping all of the information in one place. As well, having consistent healthcare providers and staff involved in outreach, both at the outreach sites and ACH has also been a benefit. So we certainly uh, don't won't go without any challenges. 
uh, when it, so I'm just going to talk about what some of them are right now. So our one concern is always uh, physician capacity. As the ACH clinics are becoming more busy, this has the potential to impact our current outreach clinics as well as our ability to grow outreach. The orientation of physicians, admin staff, or booking clerks has always been a challenge. One, being aware of any new people that are coming on board at the Children's, as well as ensuring they're knowledgeable, knowledgeable about outreach processes has always been challenging. The data collection system that we've set up is a bit labor intensive. We're uh, still doing it mainly by paper. And so uh, the clinics keep the data, um, track the data for us and then send it to us and then we keep track of it here. There's uh, as well limited clinic time. So when there's traveling and the clinics are done in the same day, that makes for a very long day for the physicians. As well, the flight times have changed and so it's not all that convenient. There's sometimes the physicians don't get there until 10.30 or so and then they run their clinic throughout the day and are often catching the seven o'clock flight. We're required to register patients at both sites. This is uh, creates a bit of extra work and is a bit cumbersome. So uh, we hope with our new uh, system that's coming, our Connect Care, that this will be make things much easier and that we won't have to be doing this any longer. As well, admin support capacity at the outreach sites has the potential to impact the workload at ACH. And there have been changes related to that. And so we may not be able to, um, if they can't call the patients, then it'll have to fall on staff here at ACH. So I also wanted to share with you the environment, the findings from the environmental scan that we did across Canada as part of our outreach review in 2014. We wanted to see what others were doing with respect to outreach and if there were any learnings we could take from other sites, especially around a model that we could use. We asked about demographics, how their outreach was provided, overall management of their outreach, and how they actually do their clinics. So we had 11 sites respond, nine were pediatric sites and two were general facilities. Like a number of sites, like us, a number of sites were committed to doing outreach in some capacity. So I've listed, whoops, sorry. Sorry, I skipped that, sorry. So our, during their outreach review in 2014, we also did a literature review and we looked, we went far back to 2004 to seek information about any outreach models and how others were doing outreach. Most of the articles spoke to adult outreach clinics in Australia, England and US, but there were some pediatric articles. Some of the high level findings were other outreach programs are facing similar challenges of fiscal constraint, physician capacity, buy-in from the physicians, integration with primary care services. Benefits reported by patients align with what outreach families are telling us. Telehealth is also being used in conjunction with outreach visits. Components that contribute to the success and sustainability of an outreach program include collaboration, communication, commitment to it as well. Although outreach has its challenges, those doing it seem dedicated and find it rewarding. Sorry, now on to the environmental scan. So as I mentioned, 11 sites responded. Nine of them were pediatric sites. There were um, IWK, CHEO, Stollery, Sick Kids in BC, McMasters, and Children's Hospital in London. All were committed to doing outreach in some capacity. Uh, as well, they were doing numerous subspecialties, were participating, and they involved different healthcare providers. How outreach operated could vary, varied by site, as well as varied even from clinic to clinic at a specific site. We were all struggling with similar issues, and some were taking a closer look at their outreach services like us. So as a result of that, there was we were unable to um, 
glean any information around any specific models. And there was potential uh, certainly to establish an interest group or community of practice group with other pediatric sites to share information about outreach work being done. So another thing uh, I thought might be um, helpful is that if anyone is out there that is looking at starting a new outreach clinic or um, developing one, there's a number of things that you need to consider. Uh, we have set up a new clinic recently. We had a youth health outreach program under the Adolescent Medical Division where they see um, uh, youth at risk. And uh, we also moved a genetics clinic in Lethbridge from the community to the hospital. So these were a lot bigger undertakings than I anticipated, and there were many things that we needed to consider. For instance, space requirements, as well as availability of that space, uh, as we often had to share that space with other clinics. Uh, technology, furniture and equipment and supplies. One of the biggest things that kind of took us by surprise, or me, I should say, is that uh, just taking the height and weight of children and babies, we needed to be very mindful of the space requirements around that, as well as the IPC requirements and that we needed a sink, we needed a certain height, we needed a certain amount of counter space, et cetera. So that's always been challenging uh, when we're looking at current space and having to reconfigure it to meet those needs. As well, there's administrative support uh, because it's very, um, difficult to have that admin support from the children's things are busy here and so having some admin support at the outreach site has been very helpful privileging of physicians uh, in alberta it's all site-based so it's not by location like calgary or lethbridge etc it needs to be specific to the site the privileging as well access for patients uh, for our youth at risk clinics we have two downtown and so that enables you to access it by train or by bus. As well, there's patient safety to consider. Some of the uh, clinic space that we're um, sharing or using is more adult oriented. So we just need to make it sure it's safe for our pediatric population. As well, there's signage, communi communication to stakeholders, parking, which is always a big concern for families and patient registration as we right now always have to uh, register patients both at ACH and at our outreach site. Some uh, emerging opportunities that we're looking to in the future is that we'll be uh, reinstating our CF outreach clinic in Lethbridge. Uh, we've discontinued that for a few years, but we'll be looking at restarting that up again. As well, virtual clinic visits. Many of our participants have had the opportunity to embrace this during COVID. Uh, the using, we've been using Zoom here at the Children's for clinic visits. Uh, patients can have access to even more subspecialties and they're easy to schedule and families don't even have to leave their home. So this will certainly uh, could see this impacting who is seen face to face and perhaps they'll see we've um, now we're seeing that in genetics where they're seeing more complex patients face to face at the outreach clinics. So there's definitely still a need for that. And I could also see that perhaps the virtual clinic visits may uh, increase and we may see less of telehealth as it's a little bit more work to coordinate and the patients still have to travel to a telehealth location. Uh, as well, uh, as a result of our relationships and that with our Medicine Hat PEDS unit. We've been able to partner with them in a new opportunity of telemedicine rounding where our physicians connect with uh, physicians there for patients that have been transferred from here to their site and to do rounding together through the technology. And that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Tina. Um, just a reminder to all that we can take questions over the question box, and there are a few already there, and others will uh, type as we're uh, addressing those. Um, 
the first, uh, Tina, is it, um, it sounds like most clinics are physician run. And this uh, writer assumes that if the patients or families went to the hospital for a clinic visit, they would receive multidisciplinary care. So what are your thoughts on the loss of the multidisciplinary approach in the remote clinics? And are so, the remote clinic visits not possible for patients who have a higher need for multidisciplinary care? So that is one of the things that is determined at the triage. So if a multidisp if they need to see other members of the team or there's specific testing that's required that's only available at the children's, then those patients would not be seen in outreach. So just because they're from that area, Medicine Hat or Lethbridge, doesn't mean they're automatically seen in that location. And we've run into that before where the families at one time were seen because they were from that location, but it wasn't um, so we found out that no, that wasn't appropriate to see them at that site. They should have come to the children's. And so then there was, uh, the family had to come back here instead. So that's really looked at closely during the triage process to ensure the right patient is seen in the right location, uh, et cetera, for that. And there is, so um, yeah, and that's mainly what that is. So we haven't um, had the capacity to for other healthcare providers to be at the outreach site. Okay. Um, and if Sarah, you want to follow up question, type away. Um, another question is Tina, can you clarify what you mean by outreach site manager? Okay, so we um, in, so the outreach site manager is for Medicine Hat. We uh, go to our go to is the we use the pediatric units for our outreach services. And so we would talk with a, a pediatric manager in the Medicine Hat or the Lethbridge Health Region. As well, each of the outreach clinics has a manager uh, that runs that uh, specific, um, not necessarily the clinic, but the uh, like the diabetic health um, program. So we would go to the manager for that program that's at that site. And uh, is there a manager dedicated to outreach at those outreach sites? No, they're not necessarily. Um, they're more managers for that program or the PEDS unit or the specific uh, area that we're using for our outreach clinics. And so they, we, I would just keep in touch with them and interact with them. Uh, we have a big contact list so we know who's who, who's managing, what locations, etc. And and do you have regular meetings with these outreach sites, or is it a, on an as-needed basis? It's more on an as-needed basis. Uh, for some of the areas that we're doing more outreach clinics, for at, for instance, Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, I do try to maybe once or twice a year to sit down with them and we just kind of go through, are there any concerns, what's working, what do we need to look at, or sometimes if things come up, uh, they contact me. And uh, for instance, with Medicine Hat, they had a new... Um, admin support uh, had moved on and done and went to a different area and so we had to think about what's the best way to um, change that up who's going to be doing uh, her role etc related to outreach and so it's a bit of both so I contact them a couple times to keep in touch or they may contact me or vice versa if there's an issue that we need to talk about great uh, another question, uh, how do you manage client care for outreach in between visits? Who do the patients go to for their health concerns in between? So depends on the situation. So if it's more typically a one time or one or two um, time clinic visit. So what they would do is the our subspecialist would see them in outreach and then provide a consultation letter to the referring source providing recommendations so then the pediatrician um, or GP would follow up with those recommendations if they need to be seen again in outreach or by the subspecialist then we would we do see follow-up patients in our outreach clinic so they may be seen there or it may be a one-time visit where they only see them once and we don't need to see them again 
or they may come to ACH uh, if there's any testing or any specific things they might need to see the team etc then they may have to come here to ACH for their follow-up visit oh, great uh, how did you determine where the outreach sites uh, were that required clinics and was there a centralized data collection somehow provincially that tracks um, PEDS client data to determine certain areas of greater need? Uh, no, so typically the, uh, the outreach sites identified uh, what their needs were. So Charlotte Fullerton was um, instrumental in the medicine, she's the chief of pediatrics in Medicine Hat, so she was in instrumental in identifying where some needs were. So they needed, uh, say, neurology or pulmonary or specific uh, subspecialties to come to that area. As well, that was determined, uh, the outreach sites in Lethbridge or other areas also identified that. Um, that was, a lot of that was all determined uh, when outreach was first started, but no, we did not, I don't believe we had a database per se. We had some data that indicated uh, where the population of patients came from. So we could look at the data and say, we have X number of patients in the Red Deer area, what uh, clinical um, areas they were coming to, et cetera. So we had that data for the, and at the time we were all in different regions. So um, that was when the Palliser, Chinook, and David Thompson were all uh, the regions and they were all separate regions at that time. So we did have some data that we could look at around that, as well as there was discussion with the outreach sites. Um, I don't know, Catherine, my manager is here as well. So I don't know, Catherine, if there's anything that you wanna jump in and speak to around that. Um, I, I think I would just say that you know, that we did look at the data in terms of patient numbers, um, trying to be mindful about not setting up an outreach clinic based on someone's desire, um, at least in forming those early clinics with uh, knowledge around that there was a substantive enough patient base in a community to justify setting up an outreach clinic. I think um, if we were to track way back in time when outreach kind of happened more spontaneously between um, when one physician would know another physician, for instance, in a community and sort of agree to a, a more informal arrangement to travel and see a few patients. We were trying to get away from that informal way of offering outreach and really inform what we were doing based on knowing there is enough of a patient base in that community to, to justify travel, but also really. Um, justifying it based on what the what the outreach community had to say about their own needs and I, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, when when a big tertiary center is considering offering what it has to offer to smaller communities um, we can off, we can forget that communities possess a lot of knowledge and have a, a great deal of um, you know, local expertise and understanding of uh, what their resources are and what they can manage so that it's, it's really important to enter into that collaborative discussion about what's needed and not, not have a tertiary centre presume they know what other communities require. Fair. As well, just to uh, add to that, Paula, as well, um, just looking at determining need for an outreach clinic, as Catherine said, we'd look at the population as well. We need to be look at the sort of practical things as well. Um, you know, are adequate resources available to support that, whether that's um, admin support, space, et cetera. We're finding it really challenging now to um, to if we want to start a new clinic where where would that take place because space is at a premium we have certain criteria that we need related to space or uh, ip and c requirements etc and so that's that's become a bit of a challenge as well that care is feasible in outreach clinic setting are we able to provide those services are there supports in place etc 
Um, have you considered um, providing outreach in other clinic areas, um, for example, uh, the pain, pain clinic uh, at Alberta Children's? Is that something that could go to uh, outreach as well, or are there other services in the hopper to um, provide for outreach? Really, at this time, anything is possible. So, um, because I'm I'm the outreach coordinator at this point, and and we have limited capacity in that way um, to grow outreach. We're certainly always open to clinics approaching us, which uh, we did with the one clinic for their youth clinic. That if people have ideas, we will work together with them to explore it and see what the options are. So if other clinics are interested in starting, we're definitely um, happy to look into that with them and to see what's feasible. Thank you. Um, what have you seen as um, in terms of outreach site capacity development as a result of this? H has it had an impact on the site's ability to provide services in the future without your uh, presence perhaps or via consultation only? So sorry, can you repeat that? I'm not sure I understand. Sure. Um, you're bringing your services to outreach to, to existing clinic sites. Right, right. Does your presence provide the ability to train people at that site to deliver services in a particular area, or is there any other way that it has enhanced the ability of those outreach sites to provide those services? Yes, we um, certainly had talked about that and looking at how can we build capacity within those outreach sites to perhaps see uh, some of the patients that uh, we were seeing in outreach and that that maybe they the local uh, pediatricians or family doctors can manage some of those um, cases and then we can see uh, other patients or different patients within our outreach clinics. So we did look at that with our GI clinics and that there were, uh, for instance, a number of patients um, with constipation concerns. And so we have a big uh, a teaching component related to that. And so we found that um, providing some education uh, to families and involving the outreach site related to that, that has um, helped streamline and has helped uh, those families uh, perhaps try some of the recommendations that were provided in the teaching session, working with the pediatrician along with that, and then perhaps uh, if things were still uh, a concern, then they could uh, come to the GI clinic here as well. So um, we, we have looked at that. We probably haven't explored that as much as, as we possibly could. Uh, Catherine, is there anything you want to say related to that? I, I think just it's uh, it's a capacity factor. So there's always a, a tension between demand at the Alberta Children's Hospital for a subspecialty um, being present and available on site uh, versus traveling um, to outreach clinics and spending that added amount of time to help develop capacity in the community. Um, certainly there are there are efforts made, and as Tina's alluded to, there are certain populations we've been able to uh, download more care to those outreach communities, uh, but it's always a, a bit of an interplay between uh, demands here. And I think the other factor is just a safety one that we're always considering. I, I have to throw this in since I have an opportunity. In the old days of outreach, we were really focused on and continue to be focused on uh, patient and family-centered care and care closer to home um, as a real driving force for doing outreach. I think over the years we have uh, learned a lot from our physician colleagues about fa uh, the safety factor, um, and that there um, that there are instances where safety um, has to trump um, uh, that convenience factor or care co closer to home factor for families, um, and and so there are just some patients that uh, we may do some following and outreach, but. Uh, they do have to come to the tertiary site to access more services, more testing, um, et cetera, in order to maintain safety. And we've also um, 
we used to have teaching incorporated into our outreach clinics where at lunchtime uh, the local physicians were uh, invited to come. However, um, it was always a challenge for them to leave their clinics and come for that as well. And so we have more informal um, lunch and learn type things for staff uh, or discussions or case studies as mentioned that uh, the local healthcare providers certainly um, find helpful, but nothing to the extent where uh, capacity has been built, where they've been able to take on some of this, um, some of these patients. Oh, great. Um, a, another question about, um, you mentioned virtual uh, services and telehealth services. Um, how are they different from each other? Okay, so the telehealth, the virtual um, consults that I was referring to is the ones that we've been using during COVID and it's through Zoom. And so with that technology, the families are able to connect uh, on the internet through their, um, using their computer, having a face-to-face -face conversation with the healthcare providers uh, within their own home. Uh, they've been able to schedule that with families so they don't have to go anywhere. With the telehealth, the families still have to, they uh, can have a face-to-face -face conversation with a healthcare provider, but the families need to go to a telehealth location. And so that could be at their local hospital, it could be in the community. Um, sometimes it's, um, so they still have to travel for that, whereas the virtual one uh, consults, they can just do those from home. Ah. That makes sense. Um, building on that, uh, the question is, uh, how has COVID impacted your program? So obviously one is in the delivery of some of those virtual services. Has it, has it had any other impacts? And are there implications for your future planning, be it mm -hmm. pandemic planning or otherwise? Yes, yeah, so uh, we've had to cancel some of our, for, for sure, we've canceled our uh, March and April outreach clinics. Our, and the last couple months, we've had to cancel all of our face-to-face -face outreach clinics. So the families, what they've done is tried to reschedule the families to a different time. As well, they've been able to do some of these visits via telephone or have virtual consults via Zoom. And so I think what we may see, um, I talked to one of our uh, medical director the other day about that. He was He did a pulmonary clinic and he says, I certainly see a place for these telephone calls. However, there still is a need to have those face-to-face -face conversations, but they may see different types of patients than in the outreach clinics. So for instance, genetics was saying they want to see, they'll be seeing more complex patients um, that, and perhaps um, the delay, the wait may be uh, shorter because some of these other families can be seen either virtually or by phone. And so that frees up, that may free up some space for other patients to be seen, uh, decreasing the wait time, et cetera. Um, I think it's still a little bit early days to determine uh, how else we might, hmm. how, how else the uh, COVID might impact our uh, outreach. Um, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head no, as to how sense. we see that happening. Um, a question around, you, you mentioned a, a community of practice, is that mm -hmm. uh, at a national level and, or is it within Alberta and how can folks join that community? So we were, when we did the environmental scan, we, um, we asked people if they might be interested in doing something like that and there was uh, some interest in it. Uh, however, the capacity to do that at the time was um, was difficult. And so uh, for sure it would be, I'd be certainly interested in putting in uh, having a community of practice for others that are doing outreach services, just for all of us to share ideas. And it would be national and it would be interesting to see. Um, I know we did our environmental scan and there were certain uh, pediatric sites doing outreach, but I'd certainly be interested in, uh, I don't know if people on here now would be able to say, you know, are they doing outreach right now at their site? And uh, it's always good to share uh, learnings and findings around what others are doing, etc. Yes, and, and on that note, are your 
sample documents like your service level agreements, mm -hmm. uh, principles and practices, triage process and other procedures available to folks who, who are looking at improving or starting an outreach program? Oh yes, for sure. Um, I'd be happy we have some uh, a bit of a template and it's evolved over time. So uh, now with our service level agreements, we uh, are currently only doing them for new clinics that start up, but there's certain components that we've uh, included in there. And uh, yes, we're happy to share some of those documents and our referral processes and how we uh, have done that. And um, so certainly if people are interested in some of that, they can email me and we can connect. Um, what other documents were the service level agreement? The it was um, triage, your triage process, um, other outreach procedures and the principles and practices document. Yes. So for the triage piece, each clinic kind of does um, their own has their own methods of how they do triage and so the other or are they looking more at the criteria for outreach patients and i think it's uh, th this listed as sets of examples of the resources that might people don't need to start from scratch to develop yes, because there might be a template sure. that they can adapt yes for sure because uh, um, that's always a lot of work yeah really <laughs> <laughs> and one other question around um, you you um, book your uh, outreach clinics uh, a year in advance. Is there any flexibility in there for issues that might emerge um, more immediately for some of those families? As far as changing the so for the schedule, so sorry for the schedule that I was talking about a year in advance, we book the outreach clinics one year in advance. So the dates for the clinics have all set, uh -huh. but certainly for the families, they're probably typically booked maybe a month or so in advance for some of these clinics. So definitely uh, we provide them with contact information. If something comes up for the families and they can't come to the clinic or they need to reschedule, there's certainly, uh, that's certainly doable as well for our outreach clinics. If something uh, changes for the physician or the physician gets sick or other things like that, or something comes up at the outreach site that we need to change uh, the outreach clinic, then for sure that's, it's not written in stone, but we just try and have as much mapped out ahead of time as possible. Uh, understandably. It sounds like there's a lot of logistics involved. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I'll give, that's the end of the questions that I've seen so far. I'll give folks uh, just a, a few moments to type any last minute questions in before we end that uh, portion of the presentation. Um, and in the meantime, while folks might be having a chance to type, I will thank you, Tina, very much and for you, Catherine, for responding to some of those questions as well for a really great uh, practical uh, webinar and a lot of uh, areas for where folks can uh, learn from and improve their own offerings or even begin to de consider developing one from scratch. So that's wonderful. Uh, I don't see any more questions that have come in. So I'll just, uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all on the line for your interest in this webinar, despite all of our collective Zoom fatigue in these COVID days. Typically, Children's Healthcare Canada hosts our Spark Live webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. However, during the COVID pandemic, we've been offering special editions of some of our knowledge sharing opportunities, and these may fall outside of our typical webinar time slots. To stay up to date on all of our activities and events, please sign up for our Children's Healthcare Canada Spark newsletter if you haven't already done so. It's always great if you watch live as your questions and comments enrich the discussion. But if you can't watch live, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on our Knowledge Exchange Network. Our next webinar uh, will take place tomorrow, June 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern, so note the new time, 1 p.m. Eastern, where CHEO colleagues will share their uh, shift to virtual emergency department in the middle of the pandemic. And the webinar is entitled Meeting the Challenge, a Pediatric Virtual Emergency Department. So thanks again for joining us today. Thanks to Alberta Children's Hospital 
for supporting our webinar program, and hopefully we'll see many of you back here tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Bye.